Entropic recently announced prompt caching with their cloud models. And basically the idea of prompt caching is that you can cache these frequently used contexts that you may already be using in your applications. They claim that prompt caching can reduce costs by up to 90% and latency by up to 85% for long prompts. As we know, some of these cloud models can support up to 200K context window. So the more information goes into that context, the more expensive it gets. And also the application suffers from from latency. So prompt caching comes in really handy. And they mentioned that it's useful for certain type of use cases, conversational agents. In fact, we are going to be covering one example of this in a bit. The common one is to talk to books, papers, documentation, transcripts, and other long form content. But you can also use it for tool use and other types of assistance. So right here, they show some example of the use cases and some of the cost reduction that you see. So the cost reduction really varies and it will depend basically on the use case. They share here how they are pricing this prompt caching feature. The price per million token, which is $3 for this particular model, and you can see it's available for all the different models. And for prompt caching, when you're using it, you pay a little bit more, yes, when you're writing to cache, but you actually gain a lot when you are reading from that cache. So they mentioned here, it will cost you 25% more than the base input token price when you're doing the caching, but it will cost you only 10% of the base input token price. I'm going to jump now into their documentation. And then what we're going to do is cover a few examples to show you how you can use this feature. So here are some more details about prompt caching. I'm not going to go through all of the details, but I will highlight some of the important ones. So this is just an example of how you would use this particular feature. So you can see here that this is a call to the model. And then what you can do is you can provide some system instructions. So system level instruction, and then you can cache whatever it is. You can cache an entire book, and then you can follow up with some questions. So this will be the messages where the user question goes. And we're not caching that user question, obviously, because it's not important for the application. And all we're doing is just asking questions. But there might be a scenario where you might want to ask also cache questions like that. And then in that case, what you're doing is you're continuously caching your interactions. In code, this will look like this. So here is a little notebook. And this one is obtained from their cookbook directly. This is very standard code, right? You have to set up your key. And then here, this function just fetches articles. So I have the articles here. And this one is using the Gutenberg Pride and Prejudice book. So you can see it here. Then what we can do is we can cache the book content. So the first time you're doing this, it's going to cache this book content. Notice how we are using this cache control type ephemeral. And they only have ephemeral available for now, but I think they might experiment with different types in the future. So once we have this book, then we can ask it a question, right? It was similar to that example that I just showed you. But this first call again is going to be useful for caching. So you can see at the bottom here, it took 25.4 seconds to process this request. This is obviously a really big book. And this book has over I believe 187,000 tokens. So just to store that and write that into cash, it took this amount of time. And so now what we can do is we can do a follow-up with this since it's already stored in cash and we're using the same cash control here. And then we can just ask it a question and then it will answer the question. And notice when it answered this one, when we sent this particular request, it only took 2.38 seconds. So that's the cash coming into play here. It reduces the latency, but it also is going to reduce the cost as well. So going back to the documentation here, a few important points. It's sharing here how prompt caching works. So the first thing it does, the system checks if the prompt prefix is already cached for a recent query. So it does a, a quick check on that. If found, it uses the cache version, reducing processing time. So those are the benefits that you're getting there. Otherwise, it processes the full prompt and caches the prefix for future use. Here are some details on how to implement prompt caching. So again, you can can use it with agentic use cases. So you can cache prefixes using tools, system, and the messages. And you can do that using the cache control as we showed you in that initial example. There are some cache limitations. The minimum cacheable prompt length is 1,024 tokens for Cloud 3.5 Sonnet and Opus and 2,048 tokens for Cloud 3 Haiku. 
That's an important requirement, so shorter prompts will not be cached. There's also these response issues fields we'll see it in play in a bit. They're very useful to know when you're caching, what's being cached, how much is being cached, and so on. It's giving you some updates on the cache itself. The cache has a five minute time to live. So this is the TTL. So they only have ephemeral type. This is definitely very different from the Gemini models where you can cache and you can change the time in terms of how much you want the cache to live. So you can set up to an hour, you can set for even longer times. These are just fields that you can use to understand better how much of the tokens were written to cache and how much were retrieved. And now let's look at the examples. So the first example here is this large context caching example which we just covered the second one is tool definitions so if you're building some type of agentic workflow where the language model is accessing an external tool the way you can do this is you will use something like tool usage and you will need to define your tools and for a lot of use cases actually you don't need to change the tool definition so the tool definitions remain fixed and what they're suggesting is that you can use caching so essentially you define the tool so you can see here this is one tool then we can have many more tools and we have a second tool and you can see the cache control type ephemeral here and then you can just query this as normal the model will cache these definitions so the next time you use it it's going to process the request much faster so you can imagine if you had like 100 tool definitions which is a very common thing you would see in the real world then in that case you have so much benefits that you're getting from prompt caching. And then finally, we have this multi-turn conversation. So here's a Python example for it. There are a couple of things happening with the multi-turn conversation part. So with the multi-turn conversation, you need to progressively move the cache breakpoints to be able to cache previous turns as the conversation advances. So this example doesn't really show that, but now I will show you in the code how this actually works. So I actually took their example and I added some print statements just to make it easier easier to understand for everyone. So this particular class that they created here in their code example in their cookbook kind of simulates a conversation. So there are a couple of questions that we want to ask. We want, again, to take the book content, this Pride and Prejudice, and we also want that to be part of the caching. So we're going to cache that first, and then we're going to ask it questions. So it's just going to do this by itself, right? So we don't, we only need to run this once and it's going to do that. So every time it makes an API call, it's going to take that system message, look at it right here. And then it's going to take the conversation history, which in this case is just storing the turns one by one and pulling from these turns. It needs to do that in a particular way. And the print statements that I have at the bottom will explain everything. Everything else is just uh, stats about the cache and so on. So in the first turn, what we have is a question. And you can see here that I printed this out just to explain to you. So the system message, as we saw, looks like this. In addition to that, we have this question. And the question will have, again, the cache control ephemeral. So that's the first turn. And in the first turn, we are not reading from cache, we are writing to cache because there's nothing to read from, right? There's no previous cache. So now this becomes the cache that we have available. In the second turn, what we're gonna do is we are gonna read that cache. And the way we read that cache is we need to define as part of that user content, again, the same question. So you can see here the first question and we're gonna define the cache control and type ephemeral. And then this is just the assistant content that comes from the previous turn. So we are passing that as well to the model. In addition to that, now we pass the second question. So you can see here user content, the second question, who are Mr. and Mrs. Bennett? And then it uses again, cache control ephemeral. So this is really important. As they explain in their documentation here at the bottom, they mentioned that the second to last user message is marked for caching with the cache control parameter so that this checkpoint can read from the previous cache. So if we want to read from that previous cache, we need to set the second to last. In this case, in this example, this is second to last message or user message will need to be defined with this. In the last user message as well, we need to pass this. And this basically flags to the system that the conversation is going to advance and it's going to continue. And that's really important because the next time you call, let's say there was a follow-up question, we're going to define this particular user message as part of the cache control and then that new user message that's coming. So you can see that that is what is happening here as we go 
and advance through the different turns in this simulated conversation. So let's look at turn three. In turn three, we have the third question. And you can see here in the questions now that we are asking, now we're passing the conversation as part of the context as well. So how are we gonna pass at this point, which is turn three? So you can see here, what is the title of this novel? This is the first question. And so we don't need to specify the cache for this first question anymore. What this code does is gonna look at the last two user messages and it's gonna mark those with the cache control type ephemeral. So this is what we're seeing here. So we have the second to last, and then this one is a bit longer. Then we have the last one marked as cache control type ephemeral. So, and it continues like this, right? So then in turn four, it does that. It's going to take the last two. So the first two are not marked with that cache control and so on. And it continues like this. The processing of these tokens, you're saving a lot on the latency. You're saving a lot on the cost as well. Very powerful feature. I would encourage everyone to look at the cookbook first to understand how it works, especially this multi-turn conversation part. So I'm doing a couple of tutorials for how to use prompt caching, not only with the anthropic models, but also with the Gemini models and do a more comprehensive comparison between the two. Overall, I believe that there are differences in pricing between these two providers or Gemini and the cloud models. But in general, where it differs, I think, is in the use cases and how you use the prompt caching feature. The reason is because of that five minute limitation and also because of the context lens supported by these two different models. So for Gemini models, we know we have very long context up to millions of tokens. And for the cloud models, we have up to 200K context, but that will change eventually. The anthropic model seems that they will be more suitable for these sort of short-term, short-duration type of tasks, or maybe with smaller documents. And then the Gemini models will be better for like long-term type of tasks, right? Longer duration and working with larger documents. There are a couple of other little features that distinguish the two, but I will leave it at that. And I will do a second part to this as I put together a more comprehensive example where we're caching the tool definitions and so forth. I'll be it for this video. Thank you for watching. Please consider leaving a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And I'll see you all on the next one.